Our second uh, speaker in the afternoon, in this second afternoon panel, uh, is uh, Professor Robin Blackburn, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Essex. Uh, Robin has had a remarkable uh, intellectual career now, uh, stretching to almost uh, five decades at the heart of intellectual life on the political left in this country. Uh, He's been on the editorial board of the New Left Review since 1962. He served as the editor of that journal for almost 20 years in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and he has two major uh, research projects. Uh, his uh, multi-volume study of slavery, um, the making of new world slavery from the Baroque to the modern in 1997, the overthrow of colonial slavery, 1776 to 1848, that came out in 1998. Uh, 1988, uh, and uh, I understand that there are going to be there are two more volumes on slavery uh, that are forthcoming, uh, a third uh, large study uh, in the series and a, a, a shorter summary volume. Uh, his other major project is on what's sometimes called grey capitalism on the political economy of pensions, obviously an extraordinarily important subject at the present conjuncture, and uh, we're delighted to welcome him to the symposium on Nancy Fraser's work. But when you're ready, Robin. Uh, well, thank you for those kind words, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me. And it's really a very great uh, pleasure to be at an event that is uh, debating and also celebrating Nancy Fraser's work. Uh, I've known Nancy now for nearly two decades, uh, uh, partly as a contributor to New Left Review, some of her most important articles, uh, partly as a colleague uh, at the New School for Social Research in New York, which I visited over the last 10 years, uh, and, and also as a friend. And uh, I think there are very few people who are as seriously engaged as she is with what I think are the great uh, problems uh, of life today, of human beings at the beginning of the 21st century in a crisis-wracked globe of facing all sorts of uh, tremendously daunting difficulties. And Nancy brings the resources of critical theory and uh, uh, in a fantastically clear, well-organized, uh, sustained way. Uh, and so uh, I'm just today going to introduce some comments on uh, specific points, and I'm going to... Uh, I, I did find in my work on slavery, uh, Nancy's arguments about uh, recognition uh, and redistribution enormously helpful, and I'll try and work that uh, in um, towards the end of what I say. But um, I want to start off with a remark she made yesterday uh, about the gender dimensions of the crisis, and I just want to briefly, briefly uh, indicate some of what those gender dimensions might be. Uh, and um, uh, I suppose uh, it, it, th th there's uh, a sort of aspect of my work has uh, been an interest in capitalism's propensity to develop hybrid and amalgamated forms to sort of batten on pre, what one can think of as prior forms or more s less simple forms or uh, sometimes more oppressive forms of uh, uh, labor or social organization. And um, uh, I think that um, uh, certainly one saw that with, with slavery, and I think that um, uh, the present world that we live in, uh, there are ways in which one can see a, a gender dimension, uh, uh, the tremendous surge of uh, capitalism in Southeast Asia, uh, which is a force which uh, holds out the possibility of, of emancipating uh, women, but still, relatively, it's going to be exploiting them too. Uh, the so-called nimble uh, fingers uh, of young Asian women uh, brought up in societies where Confucian ethics and patriarchal principles, uh, are, they're not just pristine, they're not just inherited and traditional, uh, but they are there are residues of them there which can be mobilized by um, investors in uh, uh, special export zones, and uh, they are at the basis of some of the gigantic 
transformations and imbalances uh, in the world that we live in. And uh, the, the crisis was a crisis produced at some level by poverty, by the great inequalities that neoliberalism had unleashed and, and which, again, Nancy was referring to in her lecture last night and last afternoon. Um, the way in which poverty, and it's often a gendered poverty, it's often a feminized poverty, enters into the equation is that um, simply the workers in these rapidly developing Asian states, and in particular China, uh, were and are paid uh, below the real value of their work. They're super exploited. They're not freely able to organize and contest the conditions under which um, uh, they're paid. Uh, they're sometimes delivered into this situation, including by family members. So, uh, uh, And uh, it may even offer them relative prospects of... Uh, uh, you know, achieving personal autonomy of uh, saving up a little money, marrying a, a, a husband, finding a husband. Uh, very often it's, you know, they're, they're working most intensively between the ages of about 14 and 24, and by that time they're then moving on to something else. Um, but um, in terms of the global capitalist economy, one of the signs that Chinese workers especially women workers, but all Chinese workers, are underpaid, is the huge imbalances that developed in the course of the last 10 or 20 years, uh, with China acquiring a huge global surplus on its trade and the United States sinking deeper and deeper into a deficit. And that imbalance created tremendous strains for the development of the global economy. Uh, one of them is that it drove down and is still, to some extent, driving down interest rates uh, in the advanced countries. That itself fed into speculation, and that introduces us to another domain of poverty. Uh, when we talk about the credit crunch, uh, I mean, to begin with, it was referred to quite properly as a subprime crisis. Uh, the term subprime simply means poor, very poor. Uh, Low-waged, uh, perhaps uh, unemployed, uh, and um, basically what happened was the great finance houses, which were always looking for new areas in which they can... Uh, their, some of their traditional activities of financing industry are being reduced, including by the surge of the Asian economy. So they're looking for alternatives. Uh, they're looking to construct finan new financial products or, or to take financial instruments like mortgage uh, deeds uh, and construe those into products which they can uh, sell on to, to customers, um, to investors. And uh, so basically there was the great need of uh, including some extremely hard-working uh, but very ill-paid uh, um, African-Americans or uh, white Americans but in women in low-paid jobs, uh, who were the particular target of uh, this great sales campaign to get them into houses, houses which they then found to be traps and which they were rejected from by foreclosures. Um, I'm sure you've read you know, many accounts of this crisis, but I, I think it behooves us to be aware that there is uh, a gender uh, 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 element here, and there's also a very powerful dose of, 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 prop, of poverty, uh, gendered, uh, but of course affecting uh, low-waged men as well as low-waged women. Uh, I think there's another dimension which lies a little deeper uh, uh, within the core of the crisis, uh, which is um, disturbances uh, that relate to the ageing society, which I've ri written about in a book called Age Shock. And um, I, I see the most important um, dimension uh, of this uh, really coming from the collapse of the birth rate. Uh, and once again, it's a complex process. Uh, partly it is young women and young couples uh, aspiring to greater freedom, greater control of their lives, and uh, uh, taking control of uh, reproduction, um, young women not having uh, so many children, the great 
burden of large numbers of children, which, uh, again, is still a reality in, in a number of countries, especially poorer ones, but with the view that um, it was, you know, there's a debate among social scientists and uh, uh, as to what the cause of the collapse in the birth rate has been. And uh, I think Joran Turborn's book, Between Sex and Power, which um, uh, published a couple of years ago, uh, struck very much the right note when he, 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 he did see this as partly uh, an impulse towards greater autonomy uh, from young women and from um, young couples. Uh, but there is also an element in it which is not always uh, entirely um, an expression of autonomy. Uh, partly there's the young couples finding that having young children was uh, extremely expensive uh, and uh, thinking that it was a good idea to delay that uh, for a few years and then finding by the time they were in their 30s uh, that uh, you know the clock was ticking away and had overtaken them and where they wanted to have two or three children but actually only had one or two. Uh, and then with about 30% of, of, of women not having children, too. Uh, so it's a complex um, situation, and I think the new concepts that Nancy is developing uh, are needed to do it. I think that purely the old Polanyi distinction between a, a phase of um, deregulation uh, followed by uh, a phase of renewed social protection I think it needs to be thought through uh, forms of social protection uh, which uh, take account of um, <coughs> the goal of emancipation and the interests of, uh, of emancipation. Well, <coughs> towards the end of what I say, I want to talk about ways in which um, uh, this, the crisis can be addressed. Um, uh, I want to just now say a few words about the experience of uh, the development of slavery uh, and emancipation because uh, I sort of find it easiest to think uh, through uh, using historical examples um, uh, and seeing uh, really what they have to offer us in terms of uh, shedding lights on, on the, the present and the future. And um, so I would say that um, the great puzzle uh, that is posed by the development of the slave systems of the 17th, 18th century uh, in the Americas, in the New World, in the European colonies, and then subsequently in the United States, Brazil, and uh, independent areas of the Americas. The great problem is that um, up until the mid-18th century, there was fairly general obliviousness, uh, uh, a fairly general acceptance of the institution of slavery. Philosophers uh, and um, great moral thinkers just did not address the question. Uh, it wasn't seen as something, uh, I mean, any, uh, uh, as a great wrong that needed uh, um, to be addressed. Uh, now, there, there, there were scattered slave revolts and there were scattered popular protests, uh, small groups, a uh, group of colonists at Germantown, uh, who, you know, but it was a private act. They sent a resolution uh, to their relig co-religionists saying that it's dangerous and wrong for us to be keeping these people in ca captivity. Uh, slavery itself had developed in the first place uh, as a result of what I would call a rather disparate, dispersed type of um, racial thinking. Um, basically, highly productive and oppressive plantation system had developed. Uh, it fed appetites, consuming appetites in Europe. Uh, it was convenient uh, to the nations that prospered from it. Um, and as I say, it was nobody criticized it and nobody attacked it. But there was uh, scattered and completely unpublicized local protests. And uh, there were also slave revolts, which sometimes prompted some of those protests. Uh, 
but uh, it was completely accepted. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, Jean Baudin has a paragraph in the six books of the Republic. That's the only example. You know, there, there's a line from Shylock uh, in uh, uh, The Merchant of Venice. You can see tiny little examples of sort of disquiet, really, or that might register disquiet. Um, but basically, uh, the great thinkers and the great moralists didn't seem to see anything wrong in it. Uh, you then get the great movement of rights, and you know, part of what we're discussing uh, in, in this symposium is the advent of women's rights. Uh, probably the first most dramatic sense in which um, rights became at issue uh, was in the wake of the American Declaration of Independence, which has a mem memorable reference to uh, unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, so there's a discourse of rights here that was not thought to apply to slaves. Uh, that was not in the minds of uh, those drafting uh, uh, the, that document. Uh, it, women also famously go unmentioned, and Native Americans are only mentioned uh, in a quite negative way. So uh, there, there are conscious and unconscious mechanisms of exclusion. But what then happened is um, a process which um, has been discussed by Lynn Hunt as um, in her book, Inventing Human Rights, as a, a cascade of, of rights, of of wider and wider spheres, groups to whom you know, rights were not being offered, emerging and claiming those rights for themselves. Uh, and um, how that happens, in particular in the case of, uh, in, the, in the late 18th century, uh, is the emergence of um, conflict between a metropolis and, uh, and, and a colonial rebels, uh, rival um, appeals being offered uh, with the British actually offering to free slaves if they'll fight against rebel masters. Um, but really it's, the, it's coming from the slaves themselves. You then get the French Revolution and really the key turning point seems to be the great uprising in uh, colonial Saint-Domingue in 1791 uh, with the slogans of the French Revolution of liberty, equality, fraternity sounding around. And even then, it takes quite a long time. It's, it's not until 1793 or 1794 that you get the idea of general liberty, of universal liberty. Uh, so it's an interesting thing that Philosophers were not in the vanguard of uh, drawing up the program of rights. Um, but on the other hand, the generalizing spirit of philosophy uh, did have a contribution to make to formulate this program of, uh, of anti-slavery. You get people like Condorcet and, and great philosophers stepping forward and s suddenly discovering slavery is wrong. You get some evangelicals, uh, like John Wesley, making the same discovery. Uh, you get the Quakers, above all, making the same discovery. Uh, but this all comes to a head in the 1770s and in the 1780s. Um, but then there's um, a further movement of revision, and it reminds me a bit of the Nancy's proposal to revise the uh, schema of, of of Karl Polanyi, uh, and that is um, you get a process whereby the Haitians, the former slaves of Saint-Domingue, um, appropriate a doctrine from the French. Uh, now, it's an important to recognize that at this time, about 95% of the population of Saint-Domingue uh, were not speaking French. They were speaking French. 
Creole, and about 65% of the slaves, and as they soon became former slaves, uh, were actually African-born. So there's something in the social constitution, even of a French slave colony, uh, which is you know, allowing spheres of autonom autonomy to develop, not part of the intention of the planters, of course, or the, still less the colonial officials, but um, a population that's speaking Creole uh, and is selectively appropriating ideas uh, from French political discourse, also selectively appropriating ideas from um, Africa. Uh, there's a Haitian saying which seems to develop from this period that tout moon say moon. Uh, every person is a person. Uh, it seems to be bubbling up from the socialists, it were, in this slave colony, something that meets halfway the idea of the emancipation of the slaves, the rights of man. Uh, and, um, of course, the great figure here is Toussaint Louverture, and there's been, you know, quite a controversy uh, to which, you know, in my new book, the, the American Crucible, I try to contribute. Uh, obviously, there was great bloodshed. There were terrible things that happened in the course of this revolution. Uh, those didn't necessarily, they weren't all necessary. They didn't all promote emancipation. Uh, someone like Toussaint Louverture was very well aware uh, that, you know, senseless slaughter was not uh, assisting the consolidation of a new freedom. Uh, and um, he had a far more deliberate and strategic goal. He wasn't just after vengeance, uh, he was after liberty, and he was quite willing to walk, work with uh, whites and um, uh, mulattoes who, to construct a new emancipation order. There's still, you know, great controversies about, you know, what that re re amounted to, uh, but certainly Napoleon was in and and a French attempt to reimpose slavery was defeated by the the new black power that developed with Toussaint. Uh, sadly, he was captured and died in France, but the new state was founded in 1804. And I just want to briefly mention uh, that the Haitian example. Uh, helped to inspire uh, movements against slavery in the rest of the New World. However, it also created a, um, a space. Uh, uh, the United States, Brazil, Cuba, the slave owners of those countries, uh, those territories saw big new market opening. The price of plantation products went up. So part of what happened with the su success of the slaves in Saint-Domingue, half a million of them freed, the world's, at that time, largest producer of plantation products uh, knocked out, creating openings to the US, Brazil, and Cuba. But also the ideas uh, began to uh, continue to circulate. And um, of course, matters came to a head with the American Civil War, with the adoption by the North of an emancipation policy. But again, there was an interesting dialectic that just as Toussaint Louverture you know, was meeting halfway and the so-called black Jacobins were meeting halfway the ideals of the French Revolution and correcting them and interpreting them and tying them down on the ground, so um, the freedmen in the United States uh, and the former free blacks, uh, who the blacker abolitionists, people like Frederick Douglass, they also changed the, and, and affected the course of emancipation itself. Uh, they came up with, with um, I mean, they were immediately meeting in, in 1864, a year before the end of the, uh, of the Civil War. You have a meeting, an African-American uh, conference in upstate New York, and they're beginning to formulate um, what they call a Declaration of Rights and Wrongs. Unlike the abolitionists who disband their organization and close their journals once slavery has been abolished, the black conferences say no, uh, just abolishing slavery is not going to be good enough because there's this powerful uh, 
racism still rampant. And uh, so th there's, a, uh, for example, in an African-American conference in, in New Orleans in, in 1868, they draw up a list of what they call public rights. So they're quite happy to have the rights of man and, and to claim the rights of man. But they also um, demand public rights. Public rights, what do they mean by that? They mean, for example, uh, the, the fact that buses, uh, uh, trains, means of transport, of public transport should be open to blacks and whites on a completely equal basis. Uh, they mean that uh, accommodation, hotels, boarding houses should be open on a completely equal basis to black and white. Uh, so they're beginning to advance far more tangible goals of equality. Uh, 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 they're beginning to revise rights and specify them uh, in, in new ways at a time when you know, the white abolitionists have really moved on to something else. Uh, I do think that the great movement of abolitionism, I mean, it had an importance that I'm sure you know about for uh, the, it was female abolitionists who met in Seneca Falls in, in 1848 and drew up the first program uh, for the rights of women and including for the suffrage. Uh, and, and that was a group of, 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 as I say, female abolitionists. So there was something in the ideology of abolitionism uh, that helped to promote this cascade of, of rights. Uh, I think there are problems with some of Lynn Hunt's uh, conceptualizations and conclusions, uh, but I think that um, uh, her basic, the, the basic impulse of her argument is correct, and I uh, you know, try to, get, to give it support in in my own writing. Now, I want to come back to the crisis and to conclude uh, with how it should be addressed. Uh, I, do, I do think we are going to find uprisings that will help us to, and examples of resistance that will make it clearer how resistance can change into genuine alternatives that avoid the oppression uh, of the existing capitalist order with all its grotesque inequalities. And I think that that um, program, I mean, the, the Egyptian uprising, uh, the resistance in China itself uh, to the oppressive social regime uh, there, there are something like 60 to 70,000 separate incidents of public protest uh, taking place in China every year. Uh, the government itself is enormously aware uh, that it's um, sitting uh, on a potential volcano and it's trying to ward off the danger of popular protest by saying that it's committed to the principles of our harmonious society, that the uh, ruling group, the Communist Party, is going to rein in the extreme inequalities and the extreme oppression. So it's trying to co-opt and prevent uh, these movements developing. But, uh, you know, one can't predict exactly when it's going to happen. But uh, there are great tensions there. And certainly the, the revision of uh, the accumulation regime of neoliberalism is going to find its antagonists in China as well as uh, it has done uh, already in the much easier conditions of Europe where it, students can protest, uh, um, uh, where public sector workers can protest and where they are actually doing so. Uh, I, I think there's a need for a new horizon uh, for such struggles uh, and without sort of falling into the pitfall of um, externalism that the previous speaker was mentioning, uh, I'd like to look at re-embedding, what re-embedding might mean in the, in, in the world today. And I think the first um, thing to address would be constructing again a public utility finance system. Uh, that is where the banks and the great finance houses uh, have as their, uh, not commercially run and not privately owned, but are run uh, uh, um, 
basically as handmaidens of uh, all those who need credit. Uh, they've, of course, got to be watchful and intelligent uh, uh, um, uh, supporters of uh, those who need credit. But uh, the credit crunch, I mean, that's really what it means. The banks are not doing what they ought to be doing. They're not helping to finance growth. Uh, and um, they are undermined by the cost disease of commercialization uh, in the area of social protection. I think if social protection is, exp is entrusted to commercial organizations, uh, which is very much the program of today's neoliberalism, to privatize pensions, to privatize social insurance, the great problem is, and we now have over a century's experience, is that commercial organizations, when they get into the business of offering social protection, uh, are, I mean, either they're great monopolies, in which case they overcharge and they shouldn't be given that privilege, or they're competitive with one another, in which they generate vast amounts of advertising and competitive marketing. And even just customizing uh, 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 and individualizing social protection, that itself entails massive administrative costs. And those admit that cost disease translates into charges. Uh, and um, so there's all the difference in the world between uh, a form of uh, social protection uh, that applies to everybody, is universalistic, and therefore enormously easy to administer, and those where you've got to keep track of all the contributions made, and you've got to tally those up, and you've got to construct uh, particular vehicles uh, for that individual. Um, so, uh, rediscovering public utility uh, finance regime, especially with regard to social protection, that's enormously important. An active credit strategy. The, the use of financial clout to impose new laws. Uh, a network of social funds. And really, to achieve this, we need new forms of taxation. Uh, taxation now overwhelmingly uh, it excludes capital. There are few Im really important or significant taxes on capital. And I think until there are, uh, I think it will be um, the tax burden that will be remaining with the laboring populations uh, will get larger and larger. Um, w what's needed is a more balanced taxation system. Uh, and um, that also could provide a a vehicle for socializing the great multinationals um, of at least providing, I mean, if they were obliged to issue shares each year equivalent to their profits uh, or to a proportion of their profits, it could be 20% or 30%, you, you, you have the ability to um, develop resources uh, that could fund a network of uh, of social funds. I, I suppose the problem I'm addressing here is that of participatory parity. Um, I think we all live in this complex post-industrial economy. Uh, there should be ways in which we, and David was earlier talking about the cooperative principles. I suppose what I feel uh, if a planning, if there's to be a phase of new social protection linked to emancipation, linked to de decommodification of social provision as well, uh, I think there must be new material resources. And uh, I'd really just conclude with this point that, um, you know, this might seem completely utopian, and to some extent it, it is almost deliberately utopian. But I, I do think we should realize we're living in a very different world now uh, from the one that existed before 2008. Uh, in 2008, the Treasury Secretary had to call in the leaders of the top 13 banks in the United States uh, and um, present them with a letter that had been uh, written beforehand and just required their signature. 
uh, in which they invited uh, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury to take great stakes, uh, great public stakes in their banks, and in which they accepted a, a bailout uh, that had, that was going to involve far-reaching control of, of, of their own enterprises. And they were given an hour, they were allowed to consult colleagues, but basically they did face, the whole system faced meltdown at that point. So once that's happened, it, the aura of finance as God, you know, has been destroyed. And um, uh, already in this country, where we have a, one of the right, most right-wing governments in the world, uh, you're still in a situation where the government has to denounce bankers the whole time and come forward with a, uh, a levy on banks. So I, I'm, I'm not able, in my book, Aid Shock, I do go into six or seven different new types of tax that would focus on capital and property and which would therefore wouldn't undermine recovery and growth, um, and which could, where the proceeds of that taxation could be used to re-stimulate the economy. But I do think my final point would be that one can draw up general schemas of what might be a better way of doing things. You know, the need for a new international reserve currency, or perhaps basket of currencies. One can see the need for such a thing. Uh, obviously, in practice, social movements are going to correct, uh, add to, subtract from, revise uh, any program one comes up with. But I think a sort of di dialectic between a moment of abstraction and the, the contribution of uh, the philosopher, the social theorist on the one hand, and the movement of, and, and the role of the movement on the other is needed. And that's why I introduced that sort of discussion in, in the middle about the relationship between the rebellion of the slaves on the one hand and, 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 and slavery uh, and emancipation on the other. Thank you very much. Thank you.